book of Nehemiah, chapter 6 this morning. It's good to see each of you. You're not in here to be punished, some of you, amen. Just, we are in the book of Nehemiah, so to speak. We've been going through. If you'd like this small, small book, let, let the pastor know later. Paul Chapel puts this out at our West Coast. And we've been using this as a supplement to the studies in this class. It's really, it was, it was penned for, for leadership. I've taken the uh, liberty of using it for uh, uh, church service over all those laboring in the work of the Lord in whatever capacity God's placed you. And I've, it's just uh, strength in your hands. It's just a small book here. If you'd like one uh, later, ask the pastor or myself. We're looking at 10 ways to remain strong in the work of the Lord. Now, whether you are a church greeter, you play the piano, you play an instrument up here, or you sing in a choir, or maybe you just warm a pew, uh, I believe each of these lessons will help you in, this, in whatever area or capacity God's placed you at Trinity in this, in this local assembly. I think one of the most difficult parts of the ministry, and I want you to listen carefully to this, I've gone through this myself. It's always, and I'm going to say this each time we start this lesson, it's easy to start something. It's always easy to start something. Emotions get running hot, get excited about something. Uh, perhaps, perhaps God stirred your heart uh, to help uh, I'll pick with, with sound system, or perhaps God stirred your heart about helping with teaching. Or maybe he's calling in some other area of the vineyard to, to labor for him. It's always easy to start something. And it'll last for a while. And you'll find after a while, you're going to need some, someone or something beyond yourself to help you with that area that God's blessed or placed on your heart to be used of the Lord. Uh, I'll give an example of just playing an instrument up here. If you think I like to play that every Sunday morning, I'm lying to you. I, Brother Doug, shame on you. Confession's good. No, there has to be something beside myself to motivate me each Sunday morning to get up and get that instrument out and make a joyful noise on that horn, albeit not always, to the Lord. Those of you singing in choir, it can be a test sometimes in one's patience during practice, during singing, why do we have to sing Sunday night, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? But you're going to find after a while, if God's placed it on your heart to be in that particular area of service, Ask God for help with it, and God will help you with it. You have to remember who you serve and why you serve and the time that God's given you to serve him to redeem it. Ten ways to remain strong in the work of the Lord. I pray that each of these, we'll go through the, through the first few of these very quickly by way of review, and I'd ask you to pay attention. We will not turn to every scripture here. But if you're struggling in an area, I pray that these lesson, or this lesson in particular, might be a blessing and a help to you. Ten ways to remain strong in the work of the Lord. Remember the source of your strength. If you look with me in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, very quickly, Hebrews chapter 4, remember the source of your strength. I have news for you, it's not you. Uh, it's, it's, after a while, it, this is a hard lesson to learn, but it's not you. The old nature is going to get tired of serving God. For some of us, it comes sooner rather than later. But the old nature, that part of you that just never seems to really go away, Galatians speaks to it, the battle that's always going on between the spirit and the flesh, that old nature says, well, what's the point? And you're going to get bored with it after a while if you're not careful. But I'll say this, remember the source of your strength. That source of your strength is your heavenly Father. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, it says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us, therefore, Christian, come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I'll challenge you to do this. You feel that, that spirit of boredom coming on, that spirit of rebelliousness. I'm tired of doing this. I'm sick of doing this. I want to quit. Ask God for help. The old nature is going to fail you. Your friends will fail you, your family will fail you, and you'll fail yourself, so to speak. Ask God for help. Remember the source of your strength. Second of all, commit to a purpose larger than yourself. Commit to a purpose larger than yourself. If you're in Nehemiah, look at me in Nehemiah chapter 2. What do you mean by that, Brother Doug? David... In 1 Samuel 17, 29, said, is there not a cause? 
I like to add to that, greater than yourself. Commit to a purpose larger than yourself. In Nehemiah chapter 2, look with me in verse number 10. When Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Commit to a purpose larger than yourself. After a while, folks, it's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about, it's about the Lord. If you study the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah's heart was burdened for his people and for rebuilding in Jerusalem. He committed to a purpose that was larger than himself. Set direction through organization. He who fails to plan, plans to fail. Um, Pray about what God's laid on your heart. Analyze it. Strategize. Organize. Count the cost. Sometimes we're quick to start, but we fail to count the cost. Wait a minute, I can't be there that often. That's not going to work. Put some thought and prayer into things before you commit to it. Analyze it for a little bit. Think about it. Study it. Plan. Uh, God's not the author of confusion in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He wants things to be done decently and in order. If you were to pull Brother Doug's choir book, don't do this, off the stand up there, you'll find that Brother Doug's choir book looks like an artillery range. Amen? Uh, that's not always so good, is it? Uh, I'm, uh, the lesson's more for me than, than you this morning. But, but in this matter of organization, it does make a difference. Being on time, being organized, putting your heart, mind, and soul into something. Maybe you've been tasked with teaching. Maybe God's spoken to your heart about lay preaching. However you want to look at it this morning, plan, organize, put some thought into it. Set direction through organization. Um, the Harvard Row team is with us this morning again, Brother Brian. Uh, Look with me, if you would, please, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. What are we speaking about this morning? Ten ways to remain strong in the work of the Lord. Anybody can quit. It gets to be a habit if you're not careful. I'm going to say this again because I've said it before. I don't know where Yale is. Either they're way out in front of Harvard or they're way behind. Whatever the case is, Yale's not in the picture. It's Harvard. And I want, to, I want you to look at this picture just for a minute here. We're speaking about practicing teamwork. Everybody's doing something in this picture, are they not, except one person. But everybody, for the most part, is doing something, aren't they? Everybody has an oar in their hand, okay? I like to look at it this way. Get in the boat. Start with getting in the boat, Okay? Be a team player. I'm kind of a lone wolf. If you haven't figured that out, you will in time. I can stand off the side and watch the parade go by and be perfectly happy. This, this distance, social distancing thing, it's great for people like me. I, it's, it fits me to a T. I'm the one sitting way up in the top row at a game or way over here or out there. Okay? It takes work for me to be a team player. But God wants me to be. God wants each of us to be. Everybody's got an oar in a boat with your name on it. It's not to whack your fellow rowers, okay? Did you catch? Never mind. Anyway. <laughs> Pick up the oar, okay? Grab an oar. And it's nice if you row in the direction that the rest are rowing, okay? There's always one or two. They might have the oar, but they're going to row in the other direction just because I'm different. Grab an oar. Be part of the team. What about that slacker in the back? What do you think that person's doing? Giving commands, giving encouragement, cadence. So you can't find an oar to use. That's just not your calling to the ministry. Well, could you at least be part of the encouragement? 
right? We're, we're discouraged. There's enough of discouragement in this world today without Christians being part of the problem. If you're not going to row, at least get in the boat, okay? At least encourage, minister grace, exhort, be part of the solution, not part of the problem. If you think what we're going through now is difficult, I'd like to just say it's a warm-up, okay? In fact, in some ways, Christian, if you set your affection on things above, you should, you should better understand what's going on around you. It shouldn't be a mystery. It shouldn't come as, wow, what's going on out there? It shouldn't be that way with God's people. Get in the boat, grab an oar. It's a team effort. Whether we like each other or not, Look at anybody, Brother Doug. <laughs> I've gotten in trouble in the past doing this. Um, we may not like each other sometimes, okay? We all have our warts and corns. You study each other long enough, you'll find a problem. It doesn't take long. It's easy to be critical. But God does command us to love each other. And he does, hey, he does command us to practice teamwork. So if you're not a team player, pray about it. Ask God for help with it. He wants you in the boat with an oar in your hand, if at all possible, or at least being an encouragement. I'll check on where Yale is later. I'm not sure if they were in, if they remembered to bring the boat to this one. But uh, anyway, be a team player. First Corinthians chapter three. And I, brethren, verse one, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. Why is that? For you're yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For well, one saith, I'm of Paul, another, I'm of Apollos. Are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted... Apollos watered, God gave the increase, yes. So then neither is he that planteth it, oh, wait a minute. I thought I had an important position here, a role. No, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are laborers together with God, you're God's husbandry, ye are God's building. God's called you to be a planter, plant. God's called you to help with the watering, be part of that process. Take care of the corner of the vineyard that God's given you to take care of. Be a team player. In Colossians, if you would please, Colossians chapter 3, very quickly here. Colossians 3. You'll hear me mention this periodically as, during lessons. Give it your best. Give it your best at whatever it is you're doing. I don't believe God likes a half-hearted approach to anything in, when it comes to the service of the Lord. I get it. I'm tired. I'm irritable sometimes. I'm not real loving nor, nor lovable. I, I get that, okay? And you probably do too. And I believe God works in spite of us a lot of times. Is that possible? I believe God runs around behind me with a big wheelbarrow and a dustpan or a shovel or rake or whatever to picking up the mess and the debris pile behind. I believe God works in spite of us, but God wants our best. Ten ways to strengthen your, yourself to remain strong in the work of the Lord. Practice teamwork. Give it your best effort. Colossians chapter 3 verse 23 tells us, Colossians 3.23, whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Why? Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. After a while, if you've been at, in, at this for any amount of time after a while, you need God's help. You need God's direction. You need, you need, you need God. And after a while, you're going to find that that's a matter of practicing teamwork. You need God's help with that, especially working together. 
And you're going to really need God's help in giving it your best shot. Because when you leave the church service today, you leave whatever area or aspect of the ministry God's, God's giving you today, you want to leave and go home this evening, you're listening, with a clear conscience that you gave it your best shot for God. You do. You don't want to leave with the thought of, well, I sort of kind of trip on some of my way through the day. Listen, that satisfies the old nature, but it doesn't satisfy your Heavenly Father. It's not for me to decide who's giving it their best shot. I have my hands full of my own backyard, okay? But think about it personally. Make the, make the lesson personal this morning. Now, look beyond the rubbish. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 4 very quickly here. Not speaking about your closet or your garage this morning. Look beyond the rubbish. Although it probably would make a good illustration. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 2. Spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in the day? In the day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Surely not. And yet you'll see God's people in verse 10 growing weary with it. And Judah said, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed. There is much rubbish so that we are not able to build the wall. I want you to think about this. Look beyond the rubbish. What crosses your mind when you read that or hear that statement? Look beyond the rubbish. You don't have to answer, but just think with me for a minute. Where others only see the rubbish or saw the rubbish, I believe Nehemiah could see the completed wall. Amen? Look beyond the rubbish. Now, you might make personal application yourself in your salvation. God can see far down the road in your own life. Let's take it a step further. I can be very critical of people, what I see. I can't look beyond the rubbish sometimes in other people's lives, but God can. You might put that in the back of your mind and do a little bit of thought and prayer about that. We're quick to criticize sometimes. I'm thankful for God's mercy in my own life. I'll, but we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Amen? Yep. And Philippians 1 speaks about Christ, what he starts, he'll finish. And we're to look under the author and finish of our faith in Hebrews chapter 12. So you just think about that as a separate devotional study. But Nehemiah could look beyond the rubbish. I believe he could see the completed wall. Look to what God can do. Did you ever stop and think about this? I want you to think about this. If God could open the door to Nehemiah going back to Jerusalem. Now think with me for a minute here. Do you think God could help with the wall? Now let's back that up a little bit more. What did Nehemiah know about Jerusalem? Who was, who, do you, who is, who is Nehemiah's stepson to? The King Artaxerxes was in charge at this point, okay? And that's who gave Nehemiah permission to go back to Jerusalem. You ever hear of Queen Esther? I want you to think about that. You ever hear of Ezra? Okay. Nehemiah had, I believe, heard and, and seen some things that God was able to do. And when he spoke to King Artaxerxes, and look with me if you would please here in Nehemiah chapter 2. He understood that if, if, if the king gave him permission. Now, now how many, let me back this up. Conquered people in those days weren't just let go back to the land. Do you understand, do you understand what's going on here? Conquered people were just weren't, well, good behavior, you're allowed back to your country of origin. Are you kidding me? That just didn't happen. So understand what's going on here. Understand the greatness of your God. And Nehemiah understood this. 
And looking beyond the rubbish, he understood, looked at, looked at what God can do. In Nehemiah chapter 2, it came to pass the month, my son, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now, I had not been before time sad in his presence, wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid and said unto the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchers, lieth waste and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? And the king said unto me, for what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, if it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shalt thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Wow. Folks, these things just didn't happen back then, okay? Nehemiah understood the hand of God was in this. And the hand, because the hand of God was in this, Nehemiah could take heart, that not only was he going back, the Jews had been back there already to Cyrus and Darius, okay, regarding the building of the temple. But God would help him with the wall and the building of the gates. Now, look to what God can do. Proverbs chapter 21.1 tells us, it may seem like a, a, a simple verse, but look with me in Proverbs 21.1 quickly. Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth whithersoever he will. Yeah, I believe God turned the king's heart. Let Nehemiah go back and build. What's more, he sent an army with him and, and letters. And when, when God's in things, he smooths the rough and straightens the crooked, and you just know the Lord's in it. You just do. Brother Brian, if you don't mind, put up uh, uh, that first slide of the, of, of it looks like just dirt pushed around. Anybody recognize where this is? I hope you do. <laughs> You're sitting on it. Amen? And then the next slide, brother. Starting to take shape. One more. Okay. Now, church fire, I thought it was 2007, Miss Linda. When the church fire occurred over on Houston Street, I'll be honest with you, the first thought was, oh, no, but underneath the surface was, you know what? God's got something in mind here. God's telling us it's time to move. I wish, uh, as it has been said, a letter was just sent down from heaven with, would you please move? <laughs> do you have to burn the building down to do it? You know what I'm saying? There was a little bit of stress and consternation at the time. I couldn't find the photos of this property with the trees still on it. Okay, I wish I could have. I don't know what I did with them. But... Looking beyond the rubbish, honestly, we, we stood out here as a, as, a, as a group, as a church back then, brother, with just trees here. And God had given us direction on this property and prayed about this, if the Lord was in it. What's fascinating about the property on Houston Street is that if you drive by that across from McCallum High School, diagonally across from there, all those little buildings there now, that property sold, it's like God just, when God's in it, get out of the way or hang on. That property sold and covered the bulk of the cost of this property and the building. It just did. It was incredible how that worked. But I'll say this, there came a point with this, you began to wonder if this would ever get done. You really did. Uh, there, were, there were a lot of problems. Um, there were just a lot of problems. At the end of a year, we still didn't have a foundation poured. Anybody remember that? At the end of a year, the foundation was still not in. That's a whole other story. But God's good, God's patient, and God takes care of things. It's a matter of looking beyond the rubbish. You, had to, you, ha you have to be able to see, so to speak, as God sees things. Now, whether it's with this building project back then, whether it's in your own life, or whether it's in the lives of a fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord, ask God to give you a vision to look beyond the rubbish. 
Because here's what happens in Christian service. When you get caught up with looking at the rubbish, what happens? You're distracted, you're swerved off the path, time is wasted, God's resources are wasted, and God doesn't get the glory from it. Now, Brother Brian, there's one more slide up there. Aha. That just didn't happen overnight, okay? I was one of those, I confess, was getting frustrated at year number two, okay? And two and a half. Will this ever get done, okay? But you have to look beyond the rubbish. Folks, we're out of time this morning. I've gone late, my apologies. I didn't plan to do that, but look, Nehemiah was a man of action. He prayed about things, okay? He just didn't talk about it. He prayed about it. He learned to rely on the Lord. I hope the lesson's been a blessing to you. Ten ways to remain strong in the work of the Lord. Today, think about this look beyond the rubbish. This stand will be dismissed with a word of prayer.